It's therefore time for member statements. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm honoured to rise and speak about an important event that took place last Thursday. International Childhood Cancer Day is recognized every February 15th to raise awareness and to express support for children and youth with cancer, survivors, and their families. It is also a call for action to address the growing challenge posed by this disease. According to the World Health Organization, who recognized International Childhood Cancer Day, one child dies of cancer every three minutes globally, and 300,000 who are 19 years and under are diagnosed with cancer every year. Cancer is the leading cause of non-communicable disease death in children globally. In Canada, cancer is the leading cause of death in children, second only to death by accident. With so many children and too many children dying of cancer, we need to continue to ensure we provide access to cutting-edge cancer therapies. Mr. Speaker, I support the call to make childhood cancer a child health priority in Ontario, Canada and across the world. The fight against childhood cancer should never be fought alone. This is why I was pleased with members of this House when this was pleased the members of this House voted unanimously in 2016 to pass my resolution and proclaim the month of September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in Ontario. This was our way of showing that we stand united to conquer childhood cancer. We stand united with all the great champions for this fight, from the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, the Maggie Project, Ag Advocacy for Child Canadian Childhood Oncology Research Network, and many others. Every one of us here has a constituent, a hospital, an individual, or corporate donors and research partners in our ridings who are either taking action or working tirelessly or doing both to ensure a brighter and healthier future for all of our children. In the case of Bruce Gray on Sound, Neil Rourke is one. Neil works every day to call for action in helping build a future free from cancer. I ask all of us to continue to support them and to keep fighting for a world free from childhood cancer because, as in the words of my hero Terry Fox, somewhere the hurting must stop. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Oshawa. 2018 is the 65th anniversary year of Community Living Oshawa Clarington, and I would like to congratulate and thank Board President Patrick Grist, Executive Director Terry Gray, the Board and the whole CLOCK team for their tremendous work in our community. Community Living Oshawa Clarington was started in 1953 by a few parents concerned for their developmentally disabled children. Now, 65 years later, CLOCK has a workforce of more than 350 and provides support and services for more than 450 people living with developmental disabilities. Its vision is for a community where everyone belongs, is listened to, is treated fairly, and can make informed choices. CLOCK believes in self-determination and the achievement of personal goals. Everyone deserves to live a meaningful life in their community. Judy Quayle is one of our bright, vibrant community living neighbors. She spoke at the anniversary event and shared, quote, Many years ago, I lived in an institution where I wasn't allowed to do what I wanted to do. I was told when to sleep, when to eat, and what I was going to eat. I was not allowed to go to school or get a job. I was not able to go out when I wanted to. When I left the institution, Community Living was there to help me. They have supported me by helping me learn the skills that I needed to be able to live in my own apartment, to get my own groceries and cook and eat what I want, go to sleep, and wake up when I feel like it. They helped to teach me the skills I needed to get a job. I go out for coffee when Whenever I feel like it, I am part of many of CLOCK's committees. CLOCK helps us to be as independent as we want to be, and I know that they have made a big difference in the lives of hundreds of other people and their families over the past 65 years. Happy anniversary, CLOCK. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure for me to rise in the House today to honour Black History Month. This month's provide us with a wonderful opportunity to recognize and celebrate the historical contributions of our black population that has defined our great country for over 400 years. From a political perspective, I can think of Lincoln Alexander, the first black MP, the first black cabinet minister, and the first black lieutenant governor of Ontario. Leonard Braithwaite, the first black MPP elected in 1963, Jean Augustine, the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to the Canadian House of Commons and the first to serve in the federal cabinet. Marianne Chambers, first black woman, liberal cabinet minister. And Zanana Akande, the first black woman elected to the Le Legislative Assembly of Ontario and the first black woman to serve as a cabinet minister in Canada. Not only is this month important for looking back, but it also gives us the opportunity to look forward at what we can do to deliver better outcomes to black communities across Ontario. Currently, the province is working on a number of items that, that aims to address anti-black racism and level the playing field so that people from the black community have the same opportunities as everyone else to be successful and thrive in our great province. 
Just a few months ago, we announced that we will invest over $1 million for public awareness campaign that will address racial prejudice and promote strength in the black community. Mr. Speaker, it is vital that we make these important investments that we can take time to celebrate the accomplishment, rich, diverse, diverse history, resiliency, creativity, and innovation of the black community. It's also equally important to recognize black history as Ontario's history and as everyone's history. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, speaker, I rise uh, to pay tribute to uh, Robert Lawn, the beloved former mayor of Prescott who died earlier this month at age 83. A longtime teacher and principal, Robert was Prescott's mayor from 2002 to 2006 and a municipal councillor from 2010 to 2014. Robert's quiet dignity and passion for his community and its people endeared him to the residents of the Fort Ten. His passing on February the 10th was a loss felt by everyone. As an educator, Robert's kindness and genuine interest in his students inspired generations of young people to do great things. Their heartfelt tributes to him over the past week are a testament to the impression he made on them. Robert loved Prescott from his arrival in 1966, and he remained relentlessly optimistic about the town's future. So it was natural that in retirement he turned his considerable wisdom towards making it a better community by getting involved in municipal politics and as a volunteer. He was also an early champion uh, on what would become Prescott's signature summer event, the, the St. Lawrence Shakespeare Festival. As an educator, community builder, and especially as a husband and father, Robert Lawn made all whose lives he touched better for the time with him. On behalf of the entire community, I want to extend my personal condolences to his wife of 57 years, Sandra, their daughters, Andrea, Carrie, and Julia, and their families, and the entire Lawn family. Uh, I want to thank them for allowing us to share Robert with them. Thank you, Speaker. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Further member statements, a member from London Fanshawe. Today, I stand on behalf of my community to express my dismay at this government's decision not to step in to save an important health program at London Health Sciences Centre. For 37 years, the Cardiac Fitness Institute, or CFI, has helped patients who have suffered a serious cardiac event with long-term rehab services, with no cut-off timelines for treatment. Despite the success of this program, LHSC has decided to shut down the program and the government has decided not to step in. Hundreds of people are worried for their health. They are wondering and cannot understand why a good program would not have been supported by this Liberal government. They are frustrated that they cannot count on getting the health care they need to be there when they need it. They are angry about the decision that removes their access to a program that has proven to be a lifeline in London. Their families are worried too, and everyone in London is disappointed that this Liberal government will not stand up and fight for London and maintain that the CFI services that our cardiac patients need at LHSC. What I want people to know, the people of London to know, is that Londoners don't have to settle for this. When I met with patients of CFI, they put it best when they said, I would not be here today if it weren't for this program. On behalf of the current and future patients of this program, I stand today demanding this government do the right thing and step in to ensure this program is not shut down. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The implementation of the new OHIP Plus Children and Youth Farmer Care is recognized as an important public health initiative for Ontario's youngest citizen. Young people under 25 now have access to over 4,400 medications with no upfront cost. These medications treat many health conditions such as allergies, diabetes, depressions, cancers, epilepsy, and asthma. When families and young people do not have to worry about cost of the prescription medications, we reduce the demands of our health care system while keeping Ontarians healthy. Sheila, a constituent of Scarborough Asian Court and a student at UTSC, stated that, quote, I witnessed numerous stress 
with access to prescription drugs. OHIP Plus provides me with financial ease and confidence to be proactive with my health." End of quote. Speaker, my riding of Scarborough Asian Court is extremely diverse and have a large newcomer population. OHIP Plus enables newcomers, young students, uh, people, and unemployed Ontarians to have access to prescription medications. Since January the 1st, an estimated 1.2 million Ontarians have used this program. Dr. Jordan Cheskis, an ophthalmologist in Scarborough, indicated, quote, OHIP Plus enable many families to access medication for their children and will likely improve medication compliance for young patients to achieve better health outcomes, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank Minister Hoskin for championing OHIP Plus and ensuring Ontario's youngest citizens have greater access and equity to health care. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Further, Member Figgs, the member from Huron-Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to welcome two young people from Huron-Bruce. They're participants in this week's Ontario Legislative Assembly Model Parliament Program. Chantille Gill is from Tiverton, and Kushali Shah is from Kincardin. And some of you may remember Kushali as she served as a page a couple of years ago. They'll both be re representing the great riding of Huron-Bruce as, as well as Simcoe Gray, with more than 100 students from across the province. I look forward to meeting both of these young, ambitious people as they acquire an appreciation for what we all do right here in the legislature and to get some first-hand experience about what life in politics is all about. And I'd like to quote Chantal Gill for a moment from her wonderful essay. In it, she wrote about the program, and I will quote, This model parliament will provide me with opportunities to meet various like-minded people who share the same passion for democratic values. And Speaker, I couldn't have said it better myself. And Kushali wrote, and I quote, I believe in moral values, crave to learn about current events, value relationships, and I am eager to face new challenges. Speaker, I look forward to being at Model Parliament reception tomorrow and to welcome these two promising young people from Huron Bruce, along with all the other participants from across the province. And I look forward to all of us seeing and greeting these young people and sharing our parliamentary experiences with them to make this experience as po rewarding as possible for all of them. Thank you very much. And I assume on our best behavior, right? Okay, I yeah. just thought I'd ask that question. Uh, member statements, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to welcome everyone back from their respective ridings. Over the past few years, I've had many wonderful conversations and very meaningful ones about chronic homelessness uh, with constituents and stakeholders from across the province. This condition impacts Ontario's most vulnerable citizens in all of our ridings. And today I'm thrilled that we're joined by leading healthcare professionals, respected homeless service providers, and key executives from across this province to shed light on this complex uh, societal challenge. Chronic homelessness is an issue that is very dear to my heart, and it is important to recognize that each person living with this condition has a unique and story and history. Many experience serious mental illness, dementia, developmental disabilities, acquired brain injuries, and substance abuse, isolationism, and despair. Remembering that each one of these individuals is a human being, that they feel pain, that they have goals, they deserve compassion, and have the right to be treated equally and fairly is so incredibly important. And as such, we have a shared responsibility to work together on chronic homelessness. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our government's goal to end chron chronic homelessness by 2025. And importantly, Ontario is supporting 48 community-led projects through the local Poverty Reduction Fund with an investment of over $16 million. I would like to welcome everyone to our reception in the dining room tonight at 5.30 to 7.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Further members of statements? The member from Lampton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am proud to congratulate Team Canada's flag bearers and the most decorated figure skaters in here. Olympic history, here. Scott Moyer and Tessa Virtue. Last night, they won the Olympic ice dance competition, their second gold medal of the 2018 Olympic Games. It was a thrilling and fitting finale to their tremendous career. Ilderton, Scott's hometown, 
and the home of the skating club where Scott and Tessa became partners, has been decked out in red and white in support of their hometown heroes. And I think the excitement from the Ilderton Community Centre last night was heard across Lambton, Kent, Middlesex and across our entire nation. Watching Tessa and Scott skate together, it's easy for fans and casual viewers alike to see it's something incredibly special. Partners since they were only seven and nine years old, these skaters and their families have made tremendous sacrifices to pursue their passion. They invested blood, sweat and tears into a career that has brought them national and international glory and more titles and medals than I have time to list. But perhaps more importantly, they have inspired people all over the world with the beauty of their craft and the tenacity with which they have pursued their dreams. I'm sure I speak for everyone in here in saying thank you, Scott and Tessa, for bringing so much excitement, passion and pride not only to your hometown, but to the sport of figure skating and to all of Canada. Thank you. Thank all members for their statements. I